Can you tell us your name and the role within the RFL, please? I'm Claire Balding and I'm president of the RFL, which is an honorary role, very much unpaid. <laughs> How did you become that? Uh, Ralph Rimmer, who's the chief exec of the RFL, rang me up and he said, I'm going to put a proposal to you that I know your immediate answer is going to be no, which is why I think you should say yes. And it was the most brilliant reverse psychology. I, I presented Rugby League for the BBC for about 10 years. And um, actually, I only stopped because of time commitments to other sports, racing in particular, but um, at that time which was a real shame because I loved it. And I've always loved the community. The players, I think, are hugely admirable. I love it as a sport. And it's always felt a place that was welcoming rather than dismissive. And you will know, not every sport is like that. And why, why is this Rugby League World Cup important for the women's game? Well, it's not just important for the women's game. I think it's a real marker. It's the first tournament in any sport that's been women's, men's and, and wheelchair all together. So we, London, London 2012 was the first time that the Olympics and the Paralympics had been planned together. So the Paralympics was genuinely parallel to the Olympics. Now that's taken as an absolute prerequisite. This is the first tournament that's been planned to be all three. I think it will change the game for everyone. And it makes perfect sense to me to have the final uh, finals, men's and women's as a double header, and the wheelchair the, the day before. I mean, it, it's, you just think, why hasn't this happened before? But it needs a bit of imagination and it needs a fair amount of investment. And most crucially of all, it does need um, logistical planning. But and what, it can work, it can work and it's working. What can we expect from the teams this tournament and why should somebody go and watch the game? In the women's? Yeah. So for the first time we've got four continents represented. Brazil are here for the first time representing South America, Canada for North America, Australia and New Zealand obviously, but Cook Islands and Papua New Guinea and then England and France from, from Europe. It, it's never been more broadly spread. It is a very fast moving game, I believe. And because you only have a limited time with the ball, so you've got to do something with it in your phase of, of six tackles, right? So you've got to make something happen before the other side gets a chance. So it's designed to be, in a sense, um, less ball hogging. <laughs> you know, in, in rugby union, and I like rugby union, but in rugby union, you could get 40 phases of play and, and the other side never even get a sniff. In rugby league, that can't happen. So I think it's more athletic as well. You know, you're not rucking and mauling. You haven't got big, heavy scrums. They're pretty much, it's just a way of recycling the ball. It's much more active. And having spoken to one of the players who has played union and league, she said the first time she played rugby league, she's never been more exhausted when she finished, like ever. Because it, it does require more running. I mean, you are moving all the time. There's hardly any slowdown of the game. Now that for a spectator is fantastic because it means it's action, action, action. And I think it's very, um, if a team is playing well together and they are thinking ahead and they're, they're anticipating each other's moves, the wingers can be set free. And there's nothing more thrilling than watching a rugby league winger, winger run three quarters of the length of the pitch at full pelt to score a try. Have you ever played? No. Would you? No. <laughs> <laughs> I'm 51, don't be ridiculous. <laughs> so how would you describe yourself as a person? Away from sports, who are you? Who am I? Um, I'm very active and energetic and I have a peripatetic brain, like it needs to constantly be moving from one thing to another. So that suits me very well because I'm freelance and I'm self-employed, so I do different things every day. I am passionate um i am um, and in that sense i get quite you know i get very involved in things and give it everything and i can get pretty angry about stuff as well if i think it's not working i don't waste time if i can avoid it so um and i probably my biggest negative is i don't deal with authority very well which again is why it's good i work for myself i don't i don't like other people imposing uh, restrictions on me. Deadlines is okay. That's that I can work to a deadline. But yeah. And would you give that advice to elite female athletes that are competing now? 
No, I think they probably do need to abide by authority um, and listen to what their coach is saying, most definitely. Uh, no, I think I'm, you know, I'm probably becoming more outspoken with age, and that's not a bad thing at all. But it gets you into a lot of trouble when you're in your 20s and 30s. There's less trouble to get into when you're in your 50s, weirdly, I think. And what do you believe is the main reason for your sporting success and your broadcasting success? Um, I'm very conscious never to dismiss any of this as luck because I think that doesn't help anyone. You, you hear so many people say, oh, I was just lucky. That doesn't help somebody follow you because then they think, oh, I just need to be lucky too. That's not. So if I really analyze it, I have been never frightened to work on events or hours or through hours that others won't work. So I used to do night shifts all the time on radio. I would do five in a row, which actually was horrible. And everybody then decided that was a bad idea. And people should only do three because they realized it was breaking us. Um, but I would work Christmas day. I would work New Year's day. I'd go and take a job in, you know, a not very glamorous place um, in the dead of winter because I thought it would teach me something. So that my work ethic was always very um, strong. Now, I look back and I go, well, I missed a few things along the way I did, but I'm making up for it now. You know, I'm making sure I'm spending time with my friends and my family now that I probably missed out on in my 20s and 30s. And I never felt it was a sacrifice. You know, there's only so many weddings you can go to, frankly, and so many christenings you want to go to, which one is enough. Um, so I, you know, in many cases, I never thought, oh, I'm, I'm choosing something I like less. I wasn't. I'm choosing something I really that matters to me, and that was work. And and last question from me: Is there a part of women's sport in general that you wouldn't like to see change with the growth? Um, I do think that women have a really powerful connection with their fans, and it doesn't matter whether it's the women footballers and you saw it after every single match of the European Championships and you've seen it in the aftermath of their victory, whether it's rugby league, rugby union, cricket, or indeed the individual sports. They, I think I wouldn't want to lose that. The trouble is, as you get more widely followed and, and popularity grows, it's quite difficult to still do that in a personal way of making those connections and feeling safe in making them. Um, but I would hope that there's a way that certainly I think digital technology can help in that regard. You know, you can always pop up on a Zoom to a school and they'll be thrilled. They'll be absolutely thrilled. And personal appearances are better. Of course they are. But it, it's just keeping those channels open and not closing yourself off to the world and disappearing into a gated community with your three sports cars um, and your heated swimming pool. Prediction for a winner for this tournament? Australia are the hot favourites. Um, I think we'll see an Australia-England final, possibly in both men's and women's. And I am really hopeful that England can push it, really push it. And they have belief, they have ability. I think they have a cohesion um, and they have the benefit of being on home soil. And, and that's huge. Um, so I, I'm, you know, I'm hoping for at least one England win, if not two or three. There you go. Thank you so much, Claire. Thank you for your time.